joining today's webinar, Preparing for the Unexpected, What to Do When the Regulator Comes Knocking. My name is Amy Pressman. I'm a partner in the Toronto and Vancouver offices at, at DLA Piper Canada LLP. And I often represent clients in litigation and advisory matters frequently with respect to regulatory compliance and non-compliance. I'm really thrilled about this discussion. We have an incredible group of panelists that um, I'm excited to hear from. The first is Steph Fogel, Stephanie Fogel, who is a partner in our Boston office, as well as the vice chair of markets and sectors at DLA Piper and the co-chair of the FDA regulatory practice and the global chair of the food and beverage sector. Stephanie's practice has a focus on multinational food and consumer product regulation and compliance, food and consumer product recall response, corporate compliance, and commercial class action and multi-plaintiff litigation. She has extensive experience advising on FDA, USDA, TTB, and CPSC related regulations. And I can also attest to the fact that she's an absolute pleasure to work with. I've had the great fortune of uh, working with her on multiple occasions. The next presenter um, is Bob Uman, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Bioforce Canada, Inc. Um, he brings over 20 years of leadership experience in sales, marketing, and operations across various industries, including pharmaceuticals, consumer packaged goods, and natural health products. He has held senior roles at companies like Sandoz, Convitec, and Abbott Laboratories, where he successfully implemented strategic marketing and sales programs. A dynamic and bilingual leader, Bob excels in driving business growth, developing partnerships, and managing diverse teams. He holds an MBA from Concordia and a bachelor's in chemical engineering from McGill University and has extensive experience in both national and international markets. Um, and thanks for joining us, Bob. And um, thirdly, we are, um, I'm, I'm excited to say that we have a, a, a regulators representative today with us. Um, Raquel Hamayoun is the director of investigations for the BC Financial Services Authority, which is the province's crown regulator of real estate services, developers, mortgage brokers, money service businesses, um, credit unions, and pension insurance and trust corporations. He has held public positions in oversight compliance, regulation, and law enforcement, and has been an expert witness in Canadian courts, including uh, testifying for BC at the Cullen Commission of Inquiry into Money Laundering, which um, I'd love to hear more about. He also served as a liaison to Dr. Peter German's Dirty Money Investigation. <coughs> Raheel's work is anchored in right touch regulation, where compliance are risk-based and proportionate. He is a special provincial constable under BC's Police Act and is a member of the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and International Association of Financial Crime Investigators. Raquel holds a degree in science from UBC and a certificate in regulatory decision making from Osgoode and York University. So today, um, there is a chat for you to um, include questions that you have. And what we will do is we will definitely provide answers to those questions if not covered today. So please feel free to add your questions to the chat. So just to get started and, and level set, um, Bob, I'd like to turn it over to you to get the uh, industry perspective of your interactions with the regulator being involved in a highly regulated business. So what do you and your business do to prepare for inspections and investigations? It's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night. Um, so as, as, a, as, a, as a CEO, one of my, pri my primary concern is obviously uh, to, my, to my stakeholders. Uh, so I'm constantly focused on how do I grow sales? How do I uh, increase volumes? How do I improve profits? So those are all things that are crossing my mind at any given time. But that being said, um, Failures in quality, failures at a regulatory level have massive consequences to those prime to those objectives. I mean, my ultimate goal is to help people and to help consumers. And if I have a quality failure, really, I've had a fundamental failure in my in my organization. So, 
when I look at something like a recall or I look at something like an audit, it's an opportunity to demonstrate on, on the, from, the, from the perspective of an audit to demonstrate that we're, we're effective. And on a recall side, it's really a, it's almost a, it's again, it's a failure. We didn't do something right. And, and for us, that's the sort of thing that keeps us, um, keeps me awake at night because for me, it's really important that we invest in quality systems. We invest in quality processes and we build kind of a culture where, you know, everyone's responsible. What I would say is, um, you know, it's the sort of thing, if you invest in quality and, you know, regulatory compliance on a regular basis, it's like an oil change. Maybe it's $150 to do it uh, every season. It's not too bad. Uh, if you wait till the car engine seizes, it's a ten or $15,000 repair. So really my goal is always, hey, let's make that continuous improvement. Let's continue to work and let's not find ourselves in that situation where we, uh, the engine sees that we're on the side of the road. Thank you. That's, that's really a um, useful level set for us. Um, so Steph, could you perhaps um, advise on some best practices to mitigate risk in advance? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what I do um, late at night is intended to avoid folks like Bob having to stay up at night um, for risk of and concern about what might be going on the next day at the company. Um, there are a lot of ways to mitigate risk in terms of, you know, potential quality issues, safety issues and recall response and preparedness. Um, I think most importantly, the whole um, process is very procedure um, oriented. It's very important to understand what you're creating, who's creating it, when it's being created, and to have a very well documented process um, so that when or if somebody questions what it is that you've done or what you're doing, because keep in mind that when these issues arise, they're not always true, right? Um, and I say that probably more as, you know, a U.S. person, because we do have such a litigious environment here in the United States, but um, you can't always assume that what you're hearing from the external consuming public is accurate, but it is very important and obviously critical to every company to be responsive and to ensure that their products are safe and are at the level of quality that they want them to be. That's their lifeblood. That's their business. So having processes in place that you can demonstrate um, what was created and when and how and that they were done in a way that complies with law is very, very important. Um, <clears throat> those processes and the compliance with laws has to be regularly updated. We have constantly evolving laws and regulations, um, and I know it can be province by province and it can be state by state, and it's really important to focus on when those change and what's driving that change from a policy perspective so that companies can really consider the business need and the risk and how they want to integrate that into their process. And with larger companies, I think it's very um, critical to think about the different types or lines of businesses that might be involved because they're not all the same. So when you're sitting at a high level, it's to really think about what does that overall structure look like? And then how do we pass that through to all of the different manufacturing or lines of business that we have in a consistent way that demonstrates our policy and our focus on safety and health and quality. Um, and to know who your team is, I mean, who does get woken up at night, um, who's in charge. It, it's it's kind of shocking how um, complicated that question can be sometimes where there's a sense of urgency and having one person calling the shots is often um, the most important piece of being um, timely in your response. Otherwise, you've got people running off and doing different things and it can be really um, frenetic and stressful on everybody. It's important to always be calm, I think, in response to a recall or dealing with an issue um, and to do practice, to do practice exercises and mock exercises. Um, I think that people perform much better when they've been through something, at least, even if it's not real. Um, and we've also done some very um, real feeling 
types of mock exercises where we have, you know, actors step in and play the role of the regulator. You know, I'm sure they wouldn't necessarily be as good maybe as Raheel would be on um, when he's actually engaged in the process. But, you know, it's it's just having to deal with that type of um, uh, reactive in the moment kind of response is, is really important, I think, to everybody functioning as a team. So um, that reference to Raheel is a good segue. So I'd like to discuss the framework for regulators. So Raheel, what are the expectations for modern regulators? Thanks, Amy, that's a good question. So I think I'd like to pull a thread. So in Bob's um, line of work in, uh, in the health product space, um, quality assurance and quality control are so key and fundamental to uh, the trust that they have to build uh, with their consumers, as well as the regulatory accountabilities that they have to adhere to. And uh, QA, you know, uh, saying what you do, and QC, doing what you say, those hallmarks are not unique just to health products. Those are those apply to regulators as well. Um, and so an office like mine and other modern, effective, fair, efficient regulators, they adhere to those principles, even if they're not called uh, the same things. Um, they anchor their work in administratively fair actions uh, that are predictable, that are logically linked to the evidence before them, that are consistent with the law, um, and that ultimately treat people uh, fairly, uh, and they know what to expect. So uh, just listening to Bob talk about his his background in the science space and his uh, work in the um, uh, health health product space, uh, and uh, Stephanie, to hear you uh, put a bow around it uh, on the type of advice you give to your clients in that space that um, have to participate in regulatory work. So, um, as I say, those expectations apply to good and modern regulators. They apply to regulators who may not fit that test as well, uh, but they apply nonetheless. Um, and that means that you can't be surprised with the regulatory accountabilities that are downloaded onto you from legislation, the regulator, um, and beyond. That means the regulator owes clarity to the public. It owes clarity to um, the entities that it regulates, whether it's in the financial services space, um, like myself, or it's in Health Canada, uh, or the Food and Drug Administration's um, regulation and enforcement in um, the health product space. So clear guidelines that are effectively communicated, that meet their industry where they are, so that are communicated in the terms that, um, that work. Uh, consumers similarly are adequately educated on you know, how they're protected, um, what, what the um, regulatory objectives are of, of government or um, uh, of the, the professional space. Um, so for the work that we do, balance is the name of the game. And um, balance for me means fairness. That means that the actions that we take as a regulator are proportionate. They're not out of line with what's expected in the regulated space. They're not uh, at odds with the severity of the conduct. In fact, it's the opposite. They're directly linked to um, you know, what we observe, how serious it is. And so if it, um, if we're seen uh, either in the moment or after the fact as being too heavy handed or unfairly treating a, an individual, there's a consequence um, for the regulator as well. Decisions can be set aside, actions can be deemed either unconstitutional or um, uh, otherwise improper. And these are the kinds of issues that regulators, good modern regulators are more than mindful of. They're, anchored in their work. Um, they drive their decisions. Um, so uh, when we're investigating someone in the financial space, in the real estate space, we understand, we know there's a lot at stake for that person. Their profession or their professional designation, their ability to practice or provide services uh, is at stake. And, you know, a hallmark, I, I don't have to tell uh, the lawyers I'm sharing the panel with or who are viewing it, um, just what what it means to have a lot at stake for a person who's subject to an investigation and the procedural safeguards that are required. Um, 
they're, lot, they're directly linked to what's at stake for the individual. So the highest procedural safeguards this country affords is when a person's liberty is at stake, when they could be incarcerated as a result um, of an investigation. The highest degree is owing the uh, right to remain silent, the uh, uh, right to um, avoid self-incrimination. Um, but as those, what at, as what is at stake uh, changes, uh, there are, uh, there are necessary changes to the procedural uh, fairnesses that are owed as well. And that means that if you're in a certain regulated sector, you may not have the right not to provide information. You may not have the right not to uh, participate in an audit or grant access to a space that would otherwise be private. Um, and so good regulators know um, when they're exercising that authority um, and um, they communicate those those um, uh, expectations really clearly, and it's up to the regulated entity to know uh, what's expected of them and act um, in accordance. So, um, yeah. Sorry, can I speak Please, to uh, I, Rhea, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, you know, and, and as a regulator, you know, as as a as a um, as an industry, someone from industry. The, what regulators do is critical, and it's like I, I do not ever get up in the morning and say I wish there were no regulator regulators and it was a free for all because it would be a free for all and every snake oil salesman on the, every corner selling everything. Um, you know, you spoke about fairness, um, and that's one of the the the, the, the key things. And I can't say I've ever worked with a, an audit where the auditor was unfair. Uh, we might not agree on all points, but it's never been unfair. But I think, you know, the fact that you're setting a standard is not just a standard for the company. It's a standard for the industry. And it gives consumers confidence that when they work with my company, well, it meets a standard um, coming from the regulator. So for me, it's P I'm part of a like that infrastructure is critical for me to build confidence with my with my consumers, with my uh, uh, retail partners. That's great. I like that you tied it back to consumers themselves because I mean, I'm a consumer, obviously, of health products, of health services, of financial services and all this space. People make their decisions based on the soundness and safety of that sector. And so in financial space, it's market integrity. Do people want to invest in the Canadian securities market or Canadian uh, real estate market? And the degree of regulation um, and how um, uh, you know, sort of sustainable or predictable those markets are, uh, is directly linked to regulation. Similarly, what you put in your body, um, you know, there's an all-time focus on, you know, how those, how those products are approved and how they are uh, ultimately how well regulation does to um, really uphold uh, consumer confidence in a sector um, as well as, you know, ultimately protect um, people from bad markets, bad products. Yeah, I, I had, can I add to that too, Amy? I'm sorry, we're just totally taking over the, the panel here, but we have so much to talk about. Um, I, I agree with what you both have um, articulated in that I think everyone is aligned in that the consumer interest and the public health is paramount um, to every product that is created and developed and is intended to make its way into the consuming market. And particularly when you're talking about things that are literally consumed or applied to your body or um, that actually are the financial health and, and well-being of of the consumer. So I think that that's all um, very true and um, could not exist if we didn't have a regulatory construct for the reason that I think Bob said. There are um, others out there without good intentions and this is this um, regulatory regime that is um, e that exists is intended to ensure that at least there is a standard set for what people can and should be buying. Um, I, I would add though that, you know, from my perspective, having been through so many of these recalls and different types of, you know, regulators and coordinators who serve on that, you know, regulatory team, it's really important the extent to which they're actually educated about a particular industry or business, because a lot of the regulations are very um, technical, 
or at least that they um, anticipate that there be technical standards applied to meet those regulations. And not everybody does that the same way. And sometimes I have found, and I don't think it's from a lack of good intent, but I have seen regulators who get very much wrapped around the axle, um, so to speak, with certain compliance issues that um, are being met, just not in the way that it's being interpreted, and it creates some inconsistencies amongst those in the market, which can be really problematic. So it's really important, I think, to have a regulator who appreciates the larger industry goals and the way industry standards are set, because not all regulations will go the distance to actually establish what needs to be done to meet a certain goal or product development um, opportunity. Um, so it's it's um, it does depend on you know whether or not the regulator really knows their stuff. And sometimes we um, we can help to educate as well, which I think is sometimes my role as as the outside counsel, but it's it's important to do that in the right way. You don't want to offend anybody, you don't want to be condescending, and you want to be deferential and collaborative and all of those very positive words. So there's an art, I think, in everybody working together to get to the right goal, which is, I think, what we're all saying. So, Raheel, do you want to respond to that from the regulatory perspective as a regulator? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really interesting. It's almost as if uh, you're saying sometimes there's a letter of the law and other times there's the spirit of the law. And just from a regulator, the latter can be an uncomfortable space to play in, and that is the spirit of the law, meaning, um, you know, you're applying standards. As I say, you're, you, you're applying standards fairly. You're trying to be predictable in the outcomes you reach. People know the street knows what it can expect. The consumers know what it can expect. They can what they can expect. But sometimes an outcome is wholly unreasonable if only anchored entirely in the black and white mm -hmm. uh, paper. So there has to be space there to, to talk that through with the regulator and Truly, the principles of right touch regulation, meaning that the actions are balanced and risk based and proportionate, they address those types of um, principles, but not all regulators um, are sort of empowered to um, use that approach. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a good point. And there is a balance, as we keep coming back to, to be struck between rigorously applying standards and understanding that um, products and processes can still be reasonable where they don't um, fall squarely within those goalposts every time. So, Steph, um, I recognize that it can be very fact specific, but is there an amount of engagement with a regulator that um, you consider to be appropriate or, or best in most circumstances? I think it I think it really depends on the company and the level of interaction that may have been it had in the past and also um, what may be being developed by a particular company in a highly regulated space. So, you know, if you're thinking about whether or not you should have um, a, a relationship with a regulator, you know, some companies who sell lots of different products through different business lines and find themselves or those within their distribution purview getting into trouble with regulators in different times, they might might want to proactively communicate. How do we how do we make sure that this is going the right way? How do we um, you know keep you advised of what we're doing so that if there's an issue, we don't get you know a letter through some you know aspect of the business that doesn't make its way to my desk for you know a week and a half. I mean, it's it's about um, again, collaborating, depending upon what you think that interface is going to look like. Um, in the context of when you know, a recall is actually happening, I think it's really important for whoever is on the receiving end of the regulator's inquiry to understand what's being asked. So I wouldn't, sometimes I think there's a tendency to just, maybe they'll go away if I don't respond or you know maybe i'm not really at the top of the radar who else is getting these kinds of issues and should i you know fall into line where i'm not front and center i think it's important to be responsive um i i don't ever recommend that you just uh, 
the the tactic of avoidance even if you're a small company i just don't think that that's a very good idea and i think that you need to really listen to what the question the concern is because i am sure that when when i know that when a lot of companies get inquiries it's a, it can be a very broad brush in terms of the initial outreach so that's why again communication is so important what is it that you think is the issue you know i've read the letter or i've read the inquiry or you're at my desk and you're asking a bunch of questions. What is it that you really want? What's the authority or the basis for your being here? Um, what triggered this? And to get as much information as you can so that you can be as responsive as you can. Not to like, you know, try to narrow and avoid, but to really be responsive and have a productive um, conversation or response or reaction that's gonna, again, continue a very positive relationship with the regulator because most companies are in this for the long haul um at least the good ones are not the snake salesmen and the fly-by-nights and they want to have you know that relationship that they can rely on to get to the right place so bob as the ceo of a good one uh can you give us an example in practice absolutely and you know i always laugh i always say you know if uh, a CEO uh, misses his sales targets, so I told you at the beginning, my focus is trying to make my sale. If the CEO misses his sales targets, he misses his bonuses. If he has recall issues or issues with the regulator, he's probably out of a job. So, I mean, the reality is this, and you know, it hurts the company, hurts the company's reputation. It, it's all very uh, damaging and, and problematic. I mean, for me, you know, the, a visit by the auditor is the, Kind of the, the 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 end point of a process that's going on over the course of a year. So there's a lot of preparatory work. Um, you know, you can't you can't start preparing for an audit like a week before where he's coming. Like that's not the time. You really have to have a, a constant culture of, of compliance. Um, you know, and that comes from on top. You know, there's always a temptation to say my quality person. You know, I've got a great quality person, uh, but. Everyone wants to say she's in charge of quality. I'm not in charge of quality. She's it's her job. The reality is it's everyone's job and everyone has to participate in it. And and I think that's a big step in the right direction. And that means as you know, as a CEO, I can't sit there and say, well, it's not my job. I'm gonna delegate quality discussions to the quality lead. I've also got to support her and also uh, communicate the same kind of messaging. I think once we have uh, an auditor in place, um, I think it's really about being uh, cooperative, respectful, uh, never showing up, uh, you know, and, and, you know, especially for salespeople, we have a tendency to try to, you know, dazzle, uh, try to dazzle, try to sell. And, and you, you know, you got to rein that in. You don't want to be trying to uh, convince an auditor that, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to sell you on my compliance. Uh, you have to show compliance. You can't sell on compliance. So I'd say probably those are the two big things. And then after that, you got to make sure, you know, again, like um, Rahil said earlier, everything that I said I'm going to do, I'm doing. And everything that I say I'm doing is documented somewhere. Rahil, uh, the seminar is called What to Do When the Regulator Comes Knocking. So when you come knocking and attend at a site, what are your expectations and what gives you some comfort um, about a site? Sure. Okay. Um, so regulators are creatures of statute. We have, um, there are things expected of us just as much as they are expected of uh, regulated persons like Bob and his company and banks and uh, all sorts of regulated sectors, lawyers um, uh, themselves. So I, uh, maybe it's a little it'll be helpful if i sort of talk about what the investigation process entails what an audit process entails what's expected of a regulator uh, when they're conducting these things so uh often before they're showing up at your door they're in an assessment and planning stage and that means that they're uh either turning their minds to the results of uh, previous audits or previous findings um, or they're reviewing publicly available information about uh, your your the entity's activities um, and what they've been up to or what they've been publicizing. Uh, they may be responding to complaints or whistleblower um, uh, allegations or uh, other types of uh, more overt um, market um, alerts. Um, and so all those things may be occurring well before they arrive at your door or before you read uh, 
um, you know, a scary demand letter or summons or um, something like that. Um, so that stage is uh, pretty much guaranteed. And sorry, it may simply be part of a scheduled audit schedule. I can't remember if I said that, but it, it could be um, much more scant than the um, rigorous process I described. So um, then they enter the information gathering stage. That can be attendance at um, you know, the regulated place of business, but it may also be something more informal, a simple letter that sets out uh, what action they're taking, uh, or sorry, what I should say, what uh, activity they're undertaking and um, what actions could result and all the rest of it. So if it's an audit, it will explain that. If it's a specific investigation, it will explain that. Uh, it'll have to be in accordance with the law that applies, how much information is shared at that stage. It's not uncommon at all for very little information to be shared about the source of this investigation. Uh, however, the initial sort of scope and what it is that they're looking for um, should be explained, uh, as well as the legislative basis they're relying on. I just come back to us being creatures of statute in the regulated space. We have to have authority to ask for and in some cases demand the information um, that we're looking for. So at that stage, you may get a notification and a much more formal um, action, something like um, a summons to produce specific documents, um, a time and place that an inspection is going to occur, or a less announced um, attendance at a site. So this can have a number of reasons, sometimes because that's what the act requires. Sometimes there are certain activities that require um, no notice and you're doing a spot inspection. Other times for uh, to preserve the integrity of an investigation, um, a regulator may show up uh, at not a predetermined time and may take the records that it is seeking uh, to make sure that they aren't deleted or that they aren't altered or um, that otherwise that their continuity is maintained. Um, at that stage, it can progress to the interview stage. Key interview stages might involve members of the corporate structure, uh, persons who are working um, as at the front line doing activities. Um, and so um, that's something to um, prepare for. Um, they may be scheduled. Uh, typically, most regulators, I could, sorry, I can only speak for uh, sort of my space, but it's very common for individuals to be represented by um, by lawyers at this stage, but it's not required. Uh, generally, uh, most regulators that I'm aware of in uh, my space uh, uh, respect this uh, access to legal counsel during um, interviews, but those kinds of um, uh, different systems may have different uh, rules uh, in different countries as well. Uh, after the interview stage, it enters an analysis stage, verification stage, uh, you know, accept, accepting evidence at face value, but testing its veracity and um, um, uh, and authoring, ultimately authoring conclusions in an audit report, investigation report, things of that nature um, that, you know, equally weighs inculpatory and exculpatory evidence, uh, reports on just the facts and authors conclusions and findings that are logically linked to those facts. Um, and then an action may result. The action could be a closure for non-substantiation or um, uh, things of that nature, uh, or it could be something um, uh, more uh, serious, like a finding a fact uh, against an entity that we're um, that we're investigating or that we're auditing. So that's sort of the base for what's expected from us, what you can expect in both an audit and a, um, uh, I should say, investigatory uh, standard. But uh, I'm interested to hear sort of from my co-panelists on their perspective of the same thing. How do they view these attendances, investigation letters, demands, interviews, and <laughs> things of that nature? So, Steph, um, could you answer that question and share some best practices? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think I think what um, Brian Hill has described does make sense across um, a number of you know, regulatory constructs and and statutory guidance. I mean, the the regs do set up 
what the expectation should be in terms of the type of documentation and information you should have available and that should be accessible to a regulator should they ask to see them and where they should sit and how they should be made available um, and what type of um, protections will apply to the sharing of certain information. I mean, when you are in you know, an area that involves a lot of um, R&D and development that could be in the life sciences or the food or the tech or financial services space, um, a lot of that is, is heavily, strongly proprietary. Um, and to think about the risk of that being out in the market or shared in a way that is problematic um, is something that I think keeps a lot of um, executives up at night. So, you know, understanding how those materials are to be produced and marked and discussed um, and where there needs to be certain um, legal protections applied in a formalistic way is really important. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's it's valuable to have outside counsel, among other things, to make sure that that flow of information makes sense. Um, and I think it does depend on the stage of, of where the regulator may be appearing, whether it be a regular audit um, or visit, because those do happen um, and they're on a certain schedule. And given the resources that most regulators have, they, they appear at different times given their schedule and their resources. Um, and whether or not it's more of a response or a reaction to a whistleblower or a complaint or a competitor allegation or what have you, there's lots of sources um, of you know, inquiry that could occur. Um, so for each of those stages, I think that um, employees and those who might be in the line of sight of the regulator before you get to a formalistic type of response where I think you can be a little more uh, thoughtful and less reactive. So when you have some time during the course of an investigation to talk to individuals who may be interviewed or, you know, to have a lawyer appear with them at an, a, an interview or a deposition or whatever is going to be called at that phase. Um, in the early stages, again, it's more about people being informed and prepared um, being thoughtful and listening to the questions that are being raised to put a, to give a regulator a room where they can sit and be comfortable um, and actually talk to people, those who they might want to talk to, they might have on their list or those who you've identified as, look, if somebody appears and wants to know about our manufacturing process or how we do maintenance, you would be the person. And so these are the kinds of things you need to think about when you're answering the questions. And can you go and pull that, um, can you go back and trace that product from the source to uh, when it's ultimately provided to the consumer? And what does that look like? So um, I think that depending on the stage of the level of the inquiry, and um, where the inquiry is occurring, it's important to have your you know, resources and people and documents lined up, at least in a way that you know will be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not seamless, but as close to seamless as possible, right? You don't wanna be pulling things off some legacy system and saying, I don't have the guy who runs the IT who can answer these questions. I mean, it's important to be able to be uh, responsive and intelligent. And do you have any standard questions that you would pose to regulators when you're involved? Would there be any um, types of information? Or did we lose? We're bad. We seem to go off and then now I can see everybody again. Okay, can you perfect. Hear? I, okay. I just wanted to know if you had any standard questions that you would typically pose to regulators. I mean, I would um, have a standard set or list of questions that I would ask, especially if somebody would show up on site um, unexpected. And they would include what's the basis for the appearance? What is it that you're trying to um, identify? 
Uh, are there certain products that you're interested in? Is there a specific concern? I mean, I think as Rahil alluded to, you don't always get answers to those questions and they're not always authorized to tell you um, where this came from, especially if they're protecting the, you know, the identity or, or the personal information of somebody else who may be involved. But I do think it's important to have a standard set of questions and to go through those questions. And if you don't get answers to have some follow up, I mean, there have been circumstances that I've dealt with where they there's there's just such a sense of urgency and concern that nobody even gets the card from the regulator and doesn't even know who showed up. I mean, that's just silly, right? I mean, ask some of those basic questions and be prepared to engage as opposed to being scared. So Bob, can you give us some examples in practice of your experience with interactions with the regulators or anything you'd be willing to share here? Absolutely. Listen, I, and I think the the example of asking basic questions applies to just about everything, whether it's a, you know, a gotcha media arrival or anything else. I think it's important that your team just be drilled to ask the basic questions. Who are you? Why are you there? Um, and, you know, to give us the opportunity to say, hey, do we need to uh, uh, speak to our lawyers? Do we need to bring someone in? Like, we, we, we need to have to be able to evaluate what the risk, what the issue is. Um, but I would say in most, probably most cases, I mean, you know, unless there's a specific issue where, you know, we're usually given an advance notice um, and usually there's like a set list of, hey, I'd like to see these documents, these documents and these documents and and the opportunity there is to really make sure everything is up uh, ready, ready to go, get that all, so get your pre-inspection really set up properly, make sure people know who's gonna speak to the regulator. It's not everyone that's crossing in the hall talking about, you know, uh, resolving issues that have, you know, came, came up in the past. Like it's really to have, um, oh, you know, have the right people speaking um, and then when the inspector is in place then again it's it's not about having an adversarial relationship but it's you know in a way it's about showing who we are showing what we do having a bit of pride in what we do and um, and that way it gives everyone a chance to kind of say hey this is not a bad negative thing this is a an opportunity to show uh, not just to the regulator but to the to, to the market that we're, we're we're doing good and if they find things then we have an opportunity to correct and improve our game and and that's how we look at it and then when you get to the exit meeting again uh, as you're going through the process you're noting all the things that were mentioned all the things that the regulator kind of seemed to lean towards hey this is a problem I noticed this uh, I spoke to the person in the warehouse they said that. Um, you know, it's it's a good place to sit there and start looking at how you can start correcting things even before uh, the audit's finished, and um, and then after that you get the report and uh, hopefully uh, uh, as much as possible you're hoping that um, the regulator and you are aligned on the conclusions. There's invariably two or three items that are always a sore point, and that depending on uh, how serious they are, either maybe they're the sort of things that you kind of you bite the bullet and you say, hey. Let's do it because the cost is low. And some of them times you're going to say, hey, uh, I need to uh, bring a lawyer into the building. I need to bring uh, someone to give me the support to answer some of these questions or to, to challenge the, the conclusions. So, Rahil, are there any particular risks that companies should be aware of? Uh, no, you know, everything you said is very reasonable. You should ask exactly what the basis for the visit is. You should ask, you know, I maybe be so bold as to say what authority are you relying on in making these demands, these requests, and otherwise disrupting today's schedule activities. So this is all entirely reasonable. Any regulator who reacts other than to provide an answer is not really um, acting reasonably. Um, so as you say, there are areas that may not be as um, simple to query on, and that is the source of um, the complaint or, you know, the uh, the hyper focus and scope of the investigation at this stage and all the those kinds of things that can have impacts on the investigation's integrity. So um, so there is a balance to be struck, though, on uh, how a regulated entity participates in an investigation. So under many enactments, especially in the regulatory and non criminal context, there's often a 
a really heavy regulatory response to simply not cooperating with an investigation. So refusing to provide information, even when relying on, um, you know, principles that are core to the business, such as proprietary information and things of that nature, those can have even more serious effects sometimes than the breaches that are under investigation, the alleged breaches that are under investigation. So um, yourself, the lawyer, the regulated entity needs to know um, what their regulatory um, responsibilities are in response to an um, information demand and um, things of that nature. So, it, I mean, it comes back to sound advice from your counsel um, and a, you know, sort of thoughtful approach from the regulated entity itself. So, again, back to the balance theme, there is a balance. They do need to have legislative basis to ask or demand um, what they're asking for. But if that's been demonstrated uh, and by later finders of fact, if that is uh, determined to be accurate, a refusal to provide that information could have serious consequences as well. So we've been talking a lot about disclosure of documents and sharing of information. Much of our data and documents are now electronic. So how do you address documents being in the cloud or, or being elsewhere? Yeah, I'm happy to start with that one. Uh, so it's interesting. There was a time when um, these searches and seizures or other <clears throat> just sort of routine audits, um, they would focus on the laptop, the, the computer desktop, um, you know, things that you could pick up and take with you um, and then, you know, forensically analyze and do all these things and get it back in the hands of the business within X number of days so they can continue their work. Cell phones, you know, in more modern times today, um, I can speak for this sector and say that much is now in the cloud. And so, um, for some businesses, by the way, that's, that's not in accordance with regulation. So the people do need to know what their data uh, um, requirements are in their regulated space. And not all of those, you know, requirements for books and records um, that regulated entities have to maintain. It's not always acceptable for those to be in the cloud. Copies may be acceptable, um, but if the regulator shows up and I guess this comes back to the letter of the law discussion Stephanie raised, um, if they're not stored in accordance with the act, there could be outcomes uh, as um, unreasonable as that may seem. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're sh we shift in the enforcement space as well. So um, uh, there's different types of inspections now that uh, re require the regulated entity to hand over passwords to accounts uh, where the records are uh, located, which is, you know, um, can really incense the sensibilities of the persons being asked to give over that information. So know your uh, know your requirements in that context. Also know how you're um, protected and how you're not, and how private that information really um, is if it's um, part of the required books, records, or others of your business. So yeah, there's definitely a shift in that space, Amy, and it's kind of a more than a growth area in evidence preservation and reporting on continuity and chain of custody and and all of that um, the modern way that we all start to store our data and records and do you have any concerns Raheel, about having lawyers present and uh, maybe answering questions on behalf of the client well, certainly not with the former. Lawyers can and should be present in all sorts of uh, context, interviews, inspections, and all of that. Uh, I already shared my perspective um, and my uh, office's perspective on conducting those kinds of investigations. On providing responses on behalf of a client, that's a stickier space um, for me. I think that, uh, generally speaking, where a person is compelled to provide a response that response needs to come from them if it's a written letter from the lawyer they may need to affirm uh, themselves that uh, the words that the lawyer have written down is the words that they agree with um, so it could um, you know create extra steps and all the rest of it and ultimately lawyers who are bound by their law societies and various bars and and all that across jurisdictions they don't want to become witnesses in proceedings and they don't want to provide responses that would otherwise um, improperly make them, um, you know, uh, a party to that proceeding other than representing the true party to the proceeding. So it's a, it's a, it, you know, I'm not, I can't provide any advice in that context, but I can say from the regulator's perspective, if 
a lawyer is answering responses on behalf of uh, their client in an interview, that's typically not an acceptable outcome for for the regulator. So, um, sorry, Seth, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, you know, in terms of the modernization and evolution of you know how companies interface with regulators, it 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 certainly has changed a lot over the past ten years, five years. Um, I mean, a lot of what companies do now is very data driven. Um, it does exist in uh, the cloud environment or other types of environments that allow them to be more effective and efficient from, you know, a quality perspective, but always thinking that I think every company needs to think about the fact that as they become more proficient in technology and integrate technology and what they do in the day to day as they should, um, the regulatory world is very aware of, you know, the fact that that has happened and they do have the right to and the ability to look at what is being done in that context. So you can't really, you know, pull apart all of the pieces that have been woven together to allow a company through its supply chain to, you know, the end consumer to, to be more productive because that line of sight is also and should be visible to, to a regulator. So there's two sides of that, you know, development of, I think, um, product and consumer, um, you know, uh, provision of product and distribution um, and understanding where value comes in the chain and how quality is improved. But, you know, the regulator can only regulate well if it also ups its game and as it has done and asks the, the questions and has access to that information. So I think it's completely evolved. Some companies certainly um, still have, you know, stacks of paper and stuff in notebooks and things like that, but it's becoming less and less, I would say. COVID, COVID accelerated things so much. I mean, you know, yeah. people, if people don't want to be dragging a filing cabinet home every night so they could work the next day at the office. I mean, the reality is, um, I think just working uh, digitally, uh, working on screen uh, has changed the way we work fun uh, on a fundamental level. And I, and I, and I do applaud most regulators have made the adjustment. Um, they, they've not seen shock that, hey, a lot of quality things go back and forth. Uh, that's not paper anymore. Uh, uh, digital signatures are more acceptable, although again, depends on the on the on the sector. Um, but you know, there seems to be a, a, a again, everyone seems to be evolving, and it's 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 always fun to hear that there's a few companies that are still paper, um, but a lot of companies are trying to push the envelope and 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 be ahead of the curve. So Bob, how have you built a culture of compliance at your company? I mean, for me, the the, the big piece is really uh, owning uh, quality at the executive level. So it's not uh, the job of someone on the floor, or it's not someone just the quality department's job and they can point fingers if the audit goes badly, it's someone else's fault. It's really an organizational uh, expectation. And I think for me, that's a big piece of how you do it. I think you've got to uh, make sure that everyone understands that they, they share they share that role and that quality because the truth of the matter is quality is not one person quality is uh the, the net product of what everyone is doing through the supply chain so it's not one person one person's responsible maybe for some of the paperwork or there's a small team that's doing some of the paperwork doing the releases um but it's quality is not the is not just the paperwork the paperwork is the often the the is the the end product of all the work, but it's not all the work. Would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that um, the the issue of quality driven culture and the importance of safety driven culture is so imperative and probably one of the biggest challenges that I see across companies across the industry um, and how to convey the importance, the value of safety, even in the face of potential impact on productivity because of the need to drive sales and to show the 
in the increased improvement to bottom line and how who has to take responsibility for that so the tone has to come from the top and the person who is responsible for ensuring that that's operationalized um, may sit at different levels depending upon where the company culture is, right? So um, so I think the, the most important pieces here are to understand that quality and safety are not all, they overlap a lot. And we've actually talked about that in this in some of our past panel conversations. There's a lot of overlap, right? But they're not necessarily the same. And the drive has to come from the top for the all both to be integrated into a production cycle and also so many companies now in the space are gobbling up other companies and they're trying to diversify what it is that they do um you know commodities turning biotech and ag turning you know carbon credits and you know all the evolution with esg that we see in the space and this issue of quality and safety and tone from the top has to be perpetuated throughout that evolution and change. It's, it's just critical to, I think, the consuming public being at the top of that, you know, importance of safety and health. So I'm mindful that we only have a couple of minutes left. And so I thought perhaps we could um, share, have you share some tips of to do's and 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 to don'ts, I guess things not to do and to do. Bob, can we start with you? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think we've talked uh, a lot about fostering a culture of compliance, uh, getting that compliance thing out, making it comfortable for people to talk about areas where they think there isn't compliance in the organization. I mean, it really needs to build the the the. the culture of communication and you've got to live that example you can't be walking around saying i'm going to bring food into the production site because i'm the ceo but no one else is allowed like you've got to live uh the values and um i guess if to do another one would be you know you you, you can't wait till the inspection announcement to start working on these things you've got to have a um a, a philosophy of continuous improvement so it's not wait till the audit and then start fixing all the systems it's really how do we improve how do we get better how do we stay ahead of the curve because the truth of the matter is the curve is constantly moving and it's uh, the expectation is that we're getting better consumers the regulator the, the regulators but also the consumers are expecting more they're not expecting less over time excellent point um steph do you have anything you'd like to add yeah, I think I would add to that. I mean, we've we've emphasized throughout this um, conversation that we can't um, emphasize enough the importance of process. Um, so to you know always understand what you're doing, why you're doing, and how you're doing it, and to be able to convey and articulate that to a regulator always, um, despite any you know uh, pains of growth or um, shrinkage a company might have, that that process articulation is really critical to always make sure that um, everybody is prepared to be responsive in a way that makes sense, that does show the pride in the company and the importance of what people do and how they do it. And then also to focus on listening and understanding what the regulator is trying to do and to appreciate that you are in many ways aligned you're on the same side at the end of the day so to communicate and to continue to develop partnership i think with regulators is really important takeaway well you've definitely um established why there is a value in seeking expert guidance so <laughs> Well, so I, I'd like to thank all three of our guest speakers for joining us today. I know that I have found this conversation to be fascinating, and I'm sure all of our listeners um, do, you know, have, have enjoyed listening to your points and your, your tips as well. So I'd like to also provide um, a reminder that there are two more webinars in the Corporate Crime Compliance and Investigation Symposium series. Next week on October 16th, our team will be discussing modern slavery in Canadian supply chains and then um, wrapping up our series on October 23rd with um, uh, the Privilege Protection Plan and Step-by-Step -step Guide. So please make sure you RSVP or subscribe to the subscription list so you don't miss out on news updates for upcoming webinars. 
Um, definitely feel free to add some questions if they haven't been covered and we'll do our best to get back to you. And um, thank you so much for attending today and thank you to all the incredible panelists and uh, goodbye for now. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Yes. That's fun.